In the last video we did some data modeling where we created entities along with their relationships. In this video we're going to start with the user authentication feature and we'll build the user registration first. I have created the UI for user login and registration behind the scenes as you can see here. But this is just the UI, it does not currently work. I've created the auth controller behind the scenes along with some routes. So we have a route to render the login view, we have routes to render the register view, and then we have two post routes to login and register. If we open the auth controller here, we see that we have those two methods, and then I have created this third method, register, which we're going to fill in this lesson. Before we continue, quick reminder and a note to always run docker compose up dash d dash dash build to rebuild the containers if you're using docker. I made a couple of adjustments in docker compose yaml file, so if I open it here, I've exposed the port 9003 here to make xdebug work properly. Another thing that I added is this line right here, which uh, allows us to have our custom PHP INI file where we can modify some of the configuration options. I had to disable the fast CGI logging to avoid Nginx 502 gateway errors when the errors were being logged. So just make sure that if you're using Docker and Nginx with PHP FPM, rebuild the containers before you start with each lesson. Also make sure to run npm run dev for the front end to build the assets. All right, so let's begin. First, uh, let's open the auth controller and I kind of want to uh, dump all the request parameters that are coming in. I mean the, the post parameters. We can access the post parameters by calling get parsed body method on the request object. So we can do something like data equals request get parsed body and then var dump data. Let's check it out to see how this works. So I'm going to fill this in quick hit register and sure enough we're getting the data here ignore my very secure uh, password here uh, that doesn't matter so now our goal is to create the user entity and then persist it with the database that's the first part that we need to do so in here we can create a new user entity and then use the setter methods to set the email name and so on so we can set name to be data name the email email and then set password to password now this of course is terrible because we don't want to store passwords in raw format like this we need to hash the passwords and store the hashed values so before we uh, continue with this process let's actually take a couple of minutes and talk about password hashing today's video is brought to you by cloudways Cloudways is a managed hosting provider that takes away all the hassles of server management by emphasizing performance and simplicity. This allows you to focus on more important tasks to grow your business. So whether you're an agency with several clients or a freelance developer, Cloudways is a great option for your hosting needs. Cloudways can host almost every PHP application on several different cloud infrastructures like AWS, DigitalOcean, and so on. So sign up today using the link provided in the description of this video and use my promo code GIO15 to get a $15 hosting credit. First of all, hashing is not the same as encryption. So let's get that part out of the way. Encryption is two-way. Whatever is encrypted, it can be decrypted with the right key. Hashing, on the other hand, is one-way, which means that once it's hashed, they cannot be unhashed to reveal the original text or password behind it, so to speak. That being said, though, it does not mean that hashing alone makes your passwords and application secure. There are things to keep in mind like fast general purpose hash functions and slow hash functions and of course things like rainbow tables, brute force and dictionary attacks. This is where hashing algorithm salting and other strategies come into play. Salt basically is a random string or text that is used along with the password during hashing. They help prevent certain attacks and make it harder for the attacker to sort of crack the passwords. Different hashing algorithms and functions hash the passwords differently. Some of them handle the salt generation and include it along with the hash, while some rely on the developers to use the salt. 
let's say you had uh, one of the general purpose functions to hash your passwords like md5, sha1, or sha2, there can be uh, rainbow tables or dictionaries that contain list of passwords hashed the same way. And then they can use the power of modern computers and servers to try every single combination and eventually crack your password. General purpose hash functions like SHA-1, uh, SHA-2, and so on are great for certain things and have their use cases, but they are terrible at storing passwords. For example, a good server can crack MD5 hash in seconds, and I can show that to you right now if we open a website and just enter a hashed password of 12345 and try to crack it, you'll see that in just a couple of seconds we will get the password. You'll be surprised, but in many cases, they are successful because users don't tend to use very secure passwords and use things like their pet name, date of birth, or some uh, easy to guess digits. You can Google for more information on how the rainbow tables and dictionary attacks work and what they are, but that's uh, why different algorithms and methods exist to make password hashing more secure. So the general purpose hashing functions should not be used for password hashing. Instead, a slow hashing function should be used. Thankfully, PHP has a function called password underscore hash that you can use uh, to hash the passwords. Password hash function uses bcrypt algorithm by default, which is one of the strongest algorithms currently supported. And it takes care of salting for you and adds it to the hash that gets returned by the function. So you should be using password hash function to hash passwords and then use password verify to compare and check if the user has entered the correct password. Now let's test this out. Let's hash our password and dump it out. So I'm going to go here and before we set any password, let's simply do var dump password hash data password. And this requires uh, an algorithm to be passed and we'll use password bcrypt and that's actually the default currently set on uh, the PHP side so we could use password default as well but password default can change in future so for now we'll just use password bcrypt and as the third argument we can pass some options one of the options that uh, we should pass is the cost and we'll set this cost to 12 I'll explain what the cost is in just a minute so let's open the browser refresh the page and sure enough, we get the hashed value. Basically, the return string from the password hash contains the algorithm that it's using, the cost, salt, and the hashed password. You don't need to store all of these things separately in separate columns. You can just store this whole string in a single column. Now, you might ask, what is this cost here and why did we set it to 12? The default value of cost is usually set to 10 and at minimum you should use 10 or higher depending on what your system can handle. It's basically there to control the CPU time and the usage. Higher cost means that it needs more resources and time to generate a hash. But it also means that it's more secure against uh, things like brute force attacks. Now the lower cost means of course the less resources and time is needed for the hash to be generated but is less secure. There is a snippet of code in PHP docs that you can use to determine the proper cost for your server but we won't get into that for now. That's why I'm setting it 12 for our case and adjust it later if we need to once we actually get to the deployment process. All right, another thing that I want to mention is that a new salt should always be generated for each password, meaning that you should not use the same salt for all the passwords. Each password that you store should have a different salt. Also, if you generate the same password twice, they should not produce the same hash or salt because uh, then we are vulnerable to some of the attacks. That's why uh, using password hash is the right thing to do because it handles all of this complicated stuff for you. As you can see, if I go here and refresh the page, remember what this looks like, I'm going to copy this and then refresh, we see that it has changed. The only thing that remains same is the algorithm and the cost, but the salt and the password has been changed. In fact, I'm going to duplicate this line here. So we generate the two hashes for the exact same password and see what we get. Let's refresh the page. And as you can see, we're getting two hashes, but they're completely different. All right, so now that we know how to properly hash the passwords, we're going to copy this 
and later we can extract it to maybe some sort of uh, abstraction to uh, handle uh, hashing for us but for now this is perfectly fine so we'll put this right here and now we need to persist it and to be able to persist our entity we need entity manager so we can inject the entity manager in the constructor here and then persist the user and we also need to flush so that it gets saved in the database now i know that we have no validation but we're just trying to get this to work and then we'll add some validation and make it prettier later so let's go back to the browser let's uh, refresh the page resubmitting the form with the same data and we're getting an exception stating that the column created at cannot be no which sort of makes sense because we haven't set the created at column using the setter so one option is that we can set that using a setter here or we can use something called lifecycle events that we covered in doctrine or lesson that way it will always be set for us automatically so let's go to the user entity and we're going to add has lifecycle callbacks attribute we need a method that will uh, act as a listener and will be invoked before the entity is persisted or updated. So let's create some method here called update timestamps. And this receives lifecycle event arguments as the argument. And it's not going to return anything. And then we want to trigger this on pre persist and pre update. So we'll add pre persist and pre-update attributes and if this is new to you or sounds confusing refer back to the doctrine or lessons uh, where we covered this to refresh your memory now within this method we can set the created at and updated at timestamps so we can do something like this created at equals new date time and same thing for the updated at timestamp the thing is though we should uh, really only set the created at if it hasn't already been set before because we don't want to keep on overriding the created at date on updates we only want to update the updated at timestamp on updates but the created at should only be set if it hasn't already been set before so we can do something like if the created at is not set only then set it and this should be good enough now let's go back to the browser let's refresh the page and we're not getting any errors which is good let's check the database and sure enough the user has been created with the name email and password and the created at and updated at were set properly so this is it for this video thank you so much for watching in the next video we're going to add the validation to our form and that video will be published within a couple of days so you don't have to wait a whole week for that i decided to split it up into multiple videos because i don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of information in one single video so smash the like button if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so i'll see you in the next one